Uh, welcome to Electronic Postgraduate Patshara. Uh, I am uh, Kapil Kapoor. I was professor of English and concurrent professor of Sanskrit studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. We are today uh, talking in the context of the course paper 14, Pan-Indian Grammar. And I am going to today speak of the first module, speak in the first module, Indian Linguistic Tradition, its introduction. Language has been a subject of study. Language has been a subject of study uh, for a long time. But in ancient civilizations, only two civilizations theorized about language, India and Greece, India and Greece. Ancient India and ancient Greece. In uh, a Greek civilization, we have heard about we have heard about Plato. We have heard about Aristotle, who talk, talked of many subjects, talked of many disciplines, and among them, and during their discussion of other disciplines, they reflected on language also. But the Greek, uh, Greek reflections on language, Greek study of language was not independently motivated. It was part of the study of other disciplines. And in the context of language, the Greeks studied the alphabet. You know, they had a great respect for the Greek alphabet. And they studied the discourse, how arguments are built up. And they also studied the rhetoric. How do we use language to influence people or persuade people? The tradition, uh, which uh, we can say with the Greeks culminated in Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's book Rhetoric, and also his reflections on the grammar, parts of speech of a language in his celebrated poetics. But when we look at that analysis, we find that the Greek understanding of the system of language with Aristotle, which is almost 4th century BC, is relatively simple, simple and uh, relatively uh, non-systematized when we compare it to the tradition of language thinking and language study in India. And also the Greek tradition did not last long. It was abruptly, you know, terminated, uh, mainly because Greece was a small country and it was on the crossroads. And in the crossroads, you know, uh, with the invaders coming from both sides and Greece did not have that sufficient depth and the Greek civilization collapsed, collapsed under the impact of Romans on the one side and Persians on the other, Persians on the other. The Western tradition in linguistics, the Western tradition uh, after Aristotle is broken, broken in the sense that uh, there, is a, there is a break, there are some centuries or so, and then again some language activity is there, Again, there is a break and so on. For example, after the Greek, Greek civilization came to an end, we have the school of Alexandria, school of Alexandria where the, in the north of Africa, as you know, Alexandria is a seaport, was a seaport, in where they studied the Greek, Greek uh, literature and they translated Greek literature. So the study of language emanated from the translation of Greek classics, Greek classics. Again, there is a break after that. And then Romans, Romans picked up the study of language in the context of its public use. And rhetoric, rhetoric became their main, their main uh, discipline. And you know, we have heard of, for example, Cicero, who was a great speaker, celebrated speaker, celebrated orator. And uh, we have a, a record of uh, uh, a record of the public performance 
and public approbation for the great orators and great speakers in Rome. After that, again, there is a break till we come to around 15th, 16th century, poor royal grammar. This is the first time logic of language was studied, but again, it was not thorough, it was not comprehensive. It was more in the nature of speculation. And then we come to Europe in the 17th, 18th century, when uh, there, are, uh, there, are, uh, there is a, peak, a re revival of interest in uh, Aristotelian categories of language, which are, uh, which, are then, uh, which are then related to the categories of reality, seen as that the, lang the categories of language are categories of reality. So there is a first speculative interest in the relationship between language and reality. In fact, language study in the West, we can divide into two parts. Before the modern period, which I have just summed up, which I have just summed up, when uh, there, is a, there, is, there are ruptures and uh, there are different foci, different uh, uh, preoccupations and different thinkers, but absence of a tradition. There is no tradition. Tradition in the sense that the way one understands tradition properly, it's a linkage, continuous and accumulative linkage of texts and thinkers. That is, one after the other, there is a succession of thinkers and texts, and it is cumulative in the sense that no subsequent thinker or text is composed or writes or thinks in the without being aware of what has gone before. Now, in that sense, there, was no, there is no tradition, tradition. Then the second part of the Western study of language study is what we call modern linguistics, what we know as linguistics, which is a relatively modern subject, a relatively recent subject, recent subject. Uh, this study of language in the contemporary times, contemporary times, begins in fact with uh, with sanskrit studies with sanskrit studies we know that uh, dara shiko's uh, translation of upanishads in Pers into persian was a copy of that reached europe and uh, a french scholar dupona translated it into french around middle of the 18th century and that's got translated into other european languages and there is, suddenly there was a great interest in, in the Sanskrit, uh, in the Sanskrit thought and Sanskrit language. By 1807, most of the universities in Europe had a chair in Sanskrit, and I think the first chair in uh, uh, in uh, Copenhagen University was established around end of 18th century somewhere around the end of 18th century. So by 1807, all major universities of Europe had a chair in Sanskrit, chair in Sanskrit. And 19th century Europe was doing Sanskrit, the young people of Europe were doing Sanskrit in the 19th century, as I'll say, in India today, our young people are doing computer or commerce. So everybody, every great thinker of 19th century, European thinker, was either a Sanskritist or had had some moorings in Sanskrit literature and thought, literature and thought. The man who brought it about, the man who brought it about, this connection, this shift, this uh, sudden revival of organized systematic language study is Ferdinand de Saussure who was a professor of Sanskrit in Geneva University, in Geneva University. He was teaching Sanskrit at three levels. He was teaching Sanskrit at three levels, uh, uh, basic, intermediate, and advanced. And his courses uh, in his handwriting are still available in the, in the university, in the library, in the university library of Geneva. And some of his manuscripts are also available in Harvard University. It's uh, sad that uh, Indians do not show much interest in that, although the Japanese scholars have done work on his manuscripts. The Ferdinand de Saussure was, as I said, a professor of Sanskrit. His PhD was on the 
genitive case in Sanskrit. The genitive case is in Sanskrit is known as the Shashti, Shashti cha, sixth Karaka, and uh, it is in any case very important. The Shashti, the sixth Karaka, is very important in Sanskrit grammar, and he worked on that, and his PhD is on that. So he was a uh, brought up in the Sanskrit grammatical tradition and Sanskrit language studies. This much one can infer. He conceptualized language differently, therefore, from what was, what had been the Western viewpoint of language. The Western conception of language is that language is scriptal, a writing, a written, logos, the written word, the word uh, and the object, both are real, object that it denotes are real. The, the primacy of the written language, language is writing. That was the scriptal vision of the Western tradition. And it goes right back to Old Testament, where you remember that Moses went up to Mount Sinai and he interacted with God. God spoke to him and gave him the Ten Commandments. And he told, he requested God to put it down in writing. So, with hand of fire, God wrote, God wrote the Ten Commandments on a stone with hand of fire. That's what we are told. So, that scriptal, scriptal core of language is at the source of Western tradition. And because the written word is visible, written word is visible, therefore, and what is visible is real, so the written word is real, and the reality of the written word is then transferred transferred to the reality of the object which the written word denotes. Now, this, this is different, different from, from the Indian conception of language. India, in India, Indian language study, ancient language study, the language is primarily speech primarily speech. But I, I, I'll come to that. I'll come to that a little later at, at a slightly, we'll spend a little more time on that. Now this primacy of speech. So Saussure, Saussure shifted the Western, Western tradition of language study from written language to the spoken word. And that's why there are two expressions that are used. It's called the linguistic turn in the Western history of ideas, with Saussure, and it is also called the phonocentric revolution. It's called a revolution because once you say language is voice, is speech, the voice is, is, is at least apparently, apparently the voice takes form and disappears, while the written word continues to exist visibly. And therefore, the written, the, the, the spoken voice, the voice, the, what it talks about, what it talks about has to be conceptualized, conceptualized by the hearer. And since the hearers have to conceptualize what the spoken voice is denoting, every hearer conceptualizes differently, differently. And therefore, what the words stand for, the meaning of language, is a, is a vast flux. There is no fixed certainty of meaning, no fixed certainty of meaning. And that uncertainty, that uncertainty, Saussure communicated, inscribed in the Western consciousness, and it took the form of what we know, a movement of ideas, what we know as structuralism, structuralism. In the post-structuralist period, as we all know, the, the post-structuralism list theory, post-structuralist theory, uh, is characterized by uncertainty, uncertainty. And that linguistic uncertainty is collapsed with the simultaneous awareness of uncertainty in physics, Heisenberg's celebrated principle of uncertainty, the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's. And uh, also, the, the traumatic experience of the war, the World War I, 
which led to a loss of belief in what was taken for granted during the age of enlightenment age of enlightenment and this is what this is what this is what the what uh, uh, structuralism did to the western mind western mind and uh, from structuralism of Saussure to the postmodernism postmodernism the western thought is inspired by the conception of language that Saussure brought from the Indian tradition, from the Sanskrit tradition to the West. We have here in your in your module, we have tried to show, I think, uh, that uh, this centrality, this central shift, the score, the score shift in the West, uh, I have described here in the in the description of what Saussure meant. Saussure instrumented the linguistic turn, the, the phonocentric revolution in the Western history of ideas, in the Western history of ideas. And you will do well, you will do well to study this paragraph very carefully and from how the, uh, the West moved from certainty to uncertainty, from fixity to flux, a loss of grammar both in life and language and reducing every perceived form to a construct of the human mind, to a construct of the human mind and how this came very close to the Indian conception. Now I have just traced for you, traced for you, I said that the two, there are two ancient civilizations who theorized about language, the Greek and the Indian. And then the, the Greek, the Greek civilization, Greek civilization did not last long and the Western history of language study is marked by ruptures and breaks and shifts, shifts in focus, shifts in focus. Ultimately, in the second part, while we're dividing the Western study of language, a history of language into two parts, first is the pre-modern and the modern. The modern period begins with the, with the linguistic turn that Saussure brought about, Saussure brought about. And that's where the two traditions finally merged. So let me come back now to the ancient Indian, ancient Indian tradition. We said that, we said that, we have said in the module that uh, language study carried out by, by India's linguists under the rubric of, uh, rubric of Vayakarnas, the grammarians, has an ancient pedigree as an ancient pedigree, a very ancient pedigree. You see, you are aware that Rig Veda is the world's oldest composition. So India has the world's oldest prose and the world's oldest poetry. We have the world's first book, if we call it the book, although we don't call it a book, we call it a composition because it was oral, because our tradition is oral. Now Rig Veda itself, Rig Veda itself has many reflections on language. Uh, you must you must note that in uh, from ancient times, ancient times, language has been reflected upon and discussed and analyzed in India, both in linguistic texts, that is texts which are devoted to the study of language, and also in the non-linguistic texts such as poetry, philosophy, drama, and so on. So, if you consider if we consider Rig Veda as a as a non-linguistic composition, not devoted exclusively to language, there are almost uh, 1,200 uh, etymologies in the Rig Veda itself. Now, from Rig Vedic times onwards, there has been a consistent study of language. You may ask yourself, you may ask why, why from the ancient times Indians worried so much about language, because remember that in the oral tradition. Our texts, our composi our books, what we call books and commas, are oral compositions. We are an oral tradition and our compositions are also oral. And the oral tradition was carried on orally, that is transmitted by word of mouth from one generation to the other, one generation to the other. Therefore, it was very necessary that the accurate, accurate text is transmitted. Accurate text is transmitted. Now, how do you transmit an accurate oral text? You cannot do it unless you know 
the, the you know the nature of sounds, the study of the speech sounds, how the sounds are combined into words, how the words are combined into combined into morphological forms, and how the forms are combined into sentences, and how when the sentence is spoken, when the words are spoken, how the sounds merge with each other and change. What we call today sandhi. Sandhi hoti hai bhasha mein. To wo sandhi, agar bole hoi shabdo ko analyze karna hai, bole hoi shabdo ko ek vakya ko, ukti ko, ukti ko, utterance ko analyze karna hai, shabdo mein, aur shabdo ko varno mein, sounds mein, to hume vyakar na na chahiye, vyakar ki sense mein. We should know how to analyze words into their constituent parts, which are syllables, syllables, aksharas. And we should also know how the syllables are constituted in sounds like verb and consonant, what we call in our tradition swarvayanjana, swarvayanjan combinations, combinations. So the first science to develop in India was phonetics. Phonetics is almost simultaneously, simultaneous with the composition of text. Remember, our, we had so much focus on language that we have six auxiliary sciences, what I call, you know, the Vedangas, Che Vedanga hain, Ved Anga, Vedon ke Anga, parts, the auxiliary parts of the Vedas, parts of the Vedas, limbs of the Vedas, limbs, Anga. Now these six are phonetics, grammar, meter, etymology, social text and mathematics or astronomy, Jyotisha. I will put use the Indian words, Shiksha, Vyakarana, Nirukta, Nirukta, then uh, the uh, Samajka, that uh, Dharma Shastra and then the Jyotisha. Jyotisha. Now, out of these six limbs of Vedas, let me uh, let me use the use our words for these six uh, limbs of the Vedas: Shiksha, Vyakarana, Nirukta, Kalpa, Jyotisha, or Chanda. Chanda. Now, out of these six limbs, auxiliary sciences. How will we translate Vedangas? auxiliary sciences. Out of these six sciences, four have to do with language. That is phonetics, grammar, etymology, and meter. And meter. So these four have to do with language. So see, it is claimed that if you want to study the Vedas, you have to know these four sciences. Unless you are master of these four sciences, you cannot understand study, understudy or understand the Vedas. So this shows the importance and centrality of language study in ancient India. And beginning with that, beginning with that ancient focus on phonetics, see, the, the sound is the substance of language. Language is made up of sounds. Speech is primary. Writing is secondary. We write down what we speak. That's why you have international phonetic alphabet. Why do you have international phonetic alphabet? Because you want to write down exactly how the word is spoken. So speech is primary. So in order to understand speech, we have to understand sound. So phonetics was the first science. And from phonetics, they went to the study of words, forms. How sounds are combined into aksharas, syllables, and syllables into words. This we call a morphological construction in modern linguistics, morphological construction. And this is the subject matter of grammar, grammar, initial grammar, initial analysis, combination of sounds into syllables. And after, after phonetics, after phonetics, the next scientific study is called the Patha tradition, Patha, enumeration, enumeration of forms, enumeration of forms, combinations of sounds into words. And you can say these are lexicons. These are lists which can be called lexicons. So there is lexical study. And after part tradition, how the words are formed, how the words are formed, and what is their meaning? This is the next question. So you had the third science, 
etymology. Etymology in the West only means how the word has been derived from, borrowed from another language, and from there from another language, and like. But then in India, etymology is not how the word was borrowed from which language, because Sanskrit hardly has any borrowed language, borrowed words. Etymology in India, etymology is a poor translation of the word nirukta, which means nirvachana, exposition of words. The words are expounded to show how they are formed and what their meaning is. So we had the third science, there was nirukta, nirvachana. It is associated with yaska, yaskacharya. And we have his book, Nirukta, which is uh, not later than 9th century BC. 9th century BC, Yask was a was a was a resident of Nagarparkar, a town in Gujarat. That's why one person, one thinker says, Om Paraskaraya Namaha. I, I pay my obeisance to the scholar from Nagarpaka. So this is the third science. And from Nirukta, Nirukta, you see, look, look. First you have sounds, then the combination of sounds and the lists of words are made. Then the words are analyzed, words are analyzed, how they are formed. Now the next step is how the words are combined to form utterances, to form utterances. And that was done by the Vayakarnas, the grammarians. Although the knowledge of grammar, without knowledge of grammar, it is not possible to do phonetic analysis also. So when the phoneticians analyze the words into sounds, or when the Patha people, Patha people made different combinations of texts, term combinations of text. If there is a text A, B, C, D, they made different combinations. A, B, B, C, C, D, A, B, A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, A, and A, C, B, 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 D, C, like that. They combined the words in different combinations, what are called permutations. And in, these are called Kramapata, there are names for it, Kramapata, Jatapata, Ghanapata, different levels of complexity of combination of words in a text and they were remembered separately, memorized, so that at any given time, if a, if a, if a text was lost, it could be reconstructed accurately from different member memories, memories of different people, different scholars who had been absolutely first rate shishyas, students must have been asked to put these texts in their mind. So first sounds, then the combinations, patas, then how the words are formed, and then how the utterances are formed, and the culmination of the grammarian tradition, grammatical tradition, is Panini. Panini, who uh, the Western scholars, uh, you know, date, uh, because in India we are not a biographical people. We don't very much care when a person was born and when did he die and what clothes he wore and whether he liked tea or coffee. With this, individuals are not important for us. Ideas are important. But Panini, we can, we can place a person relatively in terms of ideas. There is a chronology of ideas. So Panini does come after Yask because the Yask's four parts of speech, Nama, Khyat, Sarga, Nipata, are the beginning. That is where Panini's Ashtadhyayi operates, where begins to operate with the four parts of speech. So Yask's Nirukta led to, led to Panini's the grammar, grammar, grammar. Although knowledge of grammatical analysis existed almost coterminously, all this uh, sequence that we are establishing, that I am establishing, is a construct to understand how the ideas evolved. But then at no point, we, are, we don't mean that when they were doing phonetics, they didn't know how to analyze words or they did not know how to analyze sentences because they were analyzing a whole utterance into parts, into parts successively right up to sounds. But to systematize the knowledge of a particular aspect, that systematized knowledge was called Shiksha, it was called Nirukta, it was called Vyakarana and when when the when the uh, when the uh, when the uh, utterances were composed from the point of view of uh, poetry, that is how to how to sing them, how to recite them, and then then it was a meter also which came in metrical chanda, 
एंड रिमेंबर दैट पानिनी पानिनी सेज हिज ग्रामर हिज पानिनी इज अष्टाध्यायी इज द कल्बिनेशन ऑफ द इंडियन इंडियन ट्रेडिशन एंड एज इन द वेस्ट वी डिवाइड द वेस्ट बिफोर मॉडर्न एंड मॉडर्न इन इंडिया वी डिवाइड द लैंग्वेज स्टडी between before panini and after panini because panini is the watershed watershed of uh, language study linguistic study in india now before panini therefore ashtadhyayi remember bloomfield what he said bloomfield what he said about ashtadhyayi that ashtadhyayi is the sammam bonam is the one of the greatest monuments of human intelligence right and before panini we have the study of sounds phonetics we have the study of uh, listing of forms study of forms and combination of words lexicons lists and we also have the study of how the words are formed from verb roots into morphological constructions and then panini how an utterance an utterance is constituted on the basis of arrangement of words arrangements of words on the basis of their mutual relationship and meaning mutual relationship and meaning how the words are combined into utterances what vakyapadi said is ukti so this indian tradition uh, this indian tradition of language study long tradition in fact after panini after panini we have we have several Uh, grammars uh, which were influenced by panini there is a whole tradition of reordering grammars reordering there is a tradition of recensions for example the buddhists they 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 reordered panini's grammar the chandra vyakarana where they they dropped the technical vocabulary and just retained the operational rules and we have the jain vyakarana jainendra vyakarana that is one tradition then after panini the other tradition was you know the commentary tradition the tika tradition on on panini tika grammar tika and the third was the study of philosophy of language philosophy of language and the fourth was fourth was uh, in fact the philosophy came after the third one third one i would say simplification of grammars and the fourth part was philosophy of language and philosophy of grammar and in that tradition we have bhartri hari's vakyapadiya a 5th century ad text the classic of language philosophy language philosophy so the concept of shabd brahma with vakyapadiya the indian language thought culminated in the conception of shabd brahma that the word itself is the creator it is the shabd which creates the world creates the world the world does not exist per se it is through words that each individual through language that each individual constructs the reality therefore one uh, indian thinker has said that the indian language indian grammarians they went out in search of to the sea coast they went out to the sea coast in search of cowrie shells cowrie dhoondne gaye aur unko moti mil gaya they got moti they found a pearl wo gaye phonetics sounds kon kon sa sound hota hai kya kya dhvani hoti hai uska kya roop hota hai dhvani kaise paida hoti hai ka kaise bola jata hai ta kaise bola jata hai aur ye yahan se shuru kiya aur pahunche shabd brahm par shabd brahm par vakya bharti hari ke sath so this is the indian tradition in which the conception of language differs three ways भाषा तीन प्रकार से हम भाषा को तीन प्रकार से अलग समझते हैं वेस्ट से अलग मानते हैं पहला हम भाषा को मांगते हैं स्पीच वी कंसिडर लैंग्वेज एज स्पीच नॉट राइटिंग नंबर टू वी कंसिडर लैंग्वेज लैंग्वेज एज ए कॉग्नेटिव सिस्टम लैंग्वेज एज ए कॉग्नेटिव सिस्टम के भाषा के थ्रू ही हमारे विचार शक्ति है हमारे विचार भाषा में ही होते हैं एंड थ्रू लैंग्वेज थ्रू लैंग्वेज we we construct the world teen cheeze three way indian view of language is different from the western in the west language is was writing for us language is speech 
in the west language is primarily studied as a communication system our thinkers study language as a cognitive system and and the third while in the west language represents reality it's a representational in indian view language constructs reality shabd to bhasha ka sambandh vichar aur satta se with thought and reality is explored intensively in the indian tradition well thank you very much